good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all our speakers, chairs, and the wonderful audiences in different parts of the world. Welcome back to yet another edition of wonderful lectures for you. The speaker for the first session of today's webinar is our honored guest from the USA, Professor Shao Polo Almeida. Professor Almeida is an associate professor in the Department of Neurosurgery at the Mayo Clinic, Florida. He has underwent training in the University of Toronto as a clinical fellow in neuro oncology and skull based surgery and cerebrovascular surgery, and additionally worked as an advanced endoscopic and open skull based surgery fellow at Cleveland Clinic, Ohio. He joined Dr. Alfredo Quinones Hinojosa and his team at the Department of Neurosurgery at the Mayo Clinic in 2021 as an associate surgeon with focus on neuro oncology and skull based surgery. He has a strong commitment to academic neurosurgery and has authored and co authored over 80 peer reviewed papers, 50 neurosurgical meeting presentations, and 25 book chapters, in addition to collaborations in microsurgical courses and academic teaching activities in international centers. His main areas of research are open and endoscopic skull based surgery, neuro oncology, and micro microsurgical anatomy. We are extremely honored to have him today as a speaker at our webinars, and today he'll be talking about cuneiferingiomas. Surgical anatomy, technical nuances, and updates in tumor biology. The speaker for the second session of today is our honored guest from China, Professor Wu Kun. Professor Kun is the chair of Skull Based Division, Chief Physician, Tutor for Graduates, Second Affiliated Hospital, School of Medicine, Xijiang University. His professional appointments include Vice Chair of Neurosurgery Branch of the Xijiang Province Medical Association, the Chair Elect of Neuro Oncology Branch, and the Director General of Neurosurgery Branch, and Committee Member of Secretary of Chinese Pituitary Tumor Cooperative Group. His clinical interests are focused upon comprehensive treatment of pituitary adenomas, microsurgical treatment of intracranial aneurysms, and neuroendoscopic treatment of skull based tumors. He has published more than 30 articles, presided over, or participated in three projects of National Nature Science Foundation of China. We are extremely honored to have him today at our webinars, and today we'll be talking about transmineral surgery for giant pituitary adenomas, experience of 239 cases. The chair for the first session of today is our honored, honored guest and senior faculty from Israel, Professor Shlomi Constantini. Professor Constantini has been the director of the largest department of pediatric neurosurgery in Israel, the Danarek Children's Hospital, since 1996. He's also the director of Israeli International Neurofibromatosis Center. Professor Shlomi specializes in the management of complex brain and spinal cord surgeries in children, focusing on those that are most, most difficult to operate. Professor Constantini is active internationally while serving roles in global organizations such as immediate past president of the IFNE, past general secretary of ISPN, president of ISPN 2018, and past vice president of the EANS. He is also a noted author who has published over 300 papers in various peer review journals and over 50 book chapters while being a member of the editorial board of many journals. We are extremely honored to have him today to chair the session of Professor Shao Paulo Almeida. The chair for the second session of today is our honored guest from London, Professor Ramesh Nair. Professor Ramesh Nair is a consultant skull base and neurovascular surgeon and the head of skull base and neurovascular surgery at the Charing Cross Hospital and St. Mary's Hospital, Imperial College Healthcare, and NHS Trust London. Professor Ramesh is the executive editor of the, Asian, of the Asian Journal of Neurosurgery and associate editor of the British Journal of Neurosurgery. He is an invited faculty to of the ACNS as well as WFS educational courses conducted worldwide. We are extremely thankful to him for accepting our invitation to chair the session of Professor Wu Kun. On behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President, Professor Yoko Kato, I would like to welcome all the speakers, chairs, and the wonderful audiences to this online platform of ACNS webinars. A very warm welcome to our colleagues in China, and we are extremely thankful to Professor Shubin for broadcasting this webinar on the WeChat channel. Dr. Liu Bun Seng from Malaysia is my co-host for today. And with that introduction, I would like to hand over this platform to our first chair, Professor Shlomi Constantini. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Very distinguished panelists. Um, just the penetration of this series and the creation of this tradition is really remarkable, <coughs> especially at this time um, of uh, crazy occurrences around the world. So congratulations, Professor Kato and Raja for incredible, incredible organization, very much to the point. Craniopharyngioma is probably the topic that has created the most fierce discussions uh, and everybody has an opinion. I think what did happen in the last uh, 20 to 25 years is the acknowledgement uh, that quality of life and the results are judged not only by the fact if the patient is moving his hands and watching, but also what is the endocrine status, whether there is morbid obesity, uh, and whether the uh, diabetes insipidus is with or without thirst mechanism. Uh, the introduction of less aggressive method uh, together with um, modern radiotherapy has um, also introduced a new line. There are also big differences between children and adults in the philosophy and maybe in the biology and the type of the disease. So 
I'm looking forward. I know we will see some um, amazing uh, anatomy and surgical results. So looking forward to hear you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Constantini. Thank you, Raja. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, and uh, thank you so much for the invitation. It's great to be here with colleagues from all around the world and with so many you know, fantastic names in the field. I'm João Paulo Almeida, an associate surgeon here at uh, Mayo Clinic campus in Florida. This is our beautiful campus uh, in the north part of Florida, in the city of Jacksonville, and uh, everybody is more than welcome to join us at any time. Uh, so I have no financial disclosures, but I always like to mention and to thank everybody that have, uh, you know, joined me in my path. I'm original born and raised in Brazil. I have to be thankful to many, many people. I have to mention Evandro de Oliveira, who was uh, my chief during residency, and uh, then I'm also my boss during a couple of years before I moved to Canada, uh, where I spent uh, about three years working with Fred Gentili, Gallery Zade, and the team at the University of Toronto, specializing in endoscopic skull based surgery. I have to thank Dad Schwartz, who I also train under uh, his uh, you know, leadership at uh, Cornell, and uh, the team at the Cleveland Clinic with Pablo Resinos, Veron Cachatri where I did an advanced fellowship after my time in Toronto. And it's a privilege to be here now again at, uh, at Mayo with Alfredo Quinones, who's been a good friend and mentor since med school and uh, uh, where Evandro was a professor as well. And with the team like I saw in Chichana, Lomo, Donald, Angela Donaldson, and now the rest of the team here who I have the privilege to, to work with. So the topic of today, uh, and I, I believe that all the topics that we face, we have to have a tree process of uh, decision making. And uh, all the points in consideration here are important for that, for that process. So the first point, of course, is to identify the problem we'll be dealing with. Today, the topic will be cranial pharyngioma. Analyzing the problem, the first point for us as surgeons will be, you know, what is the location of the tumor? What is the clinical presentation? In terms, and I would say that uh, although I'm, I'm a way more an adult neurosurgeon rather than a pediatric neurosurgeon, in cranial pharyngiomas is definitely important as well to consider the age of the patient. Developing solutions, and here we're going to focus today in surgery, but we're going to see as well that there are other uh, treatment modalities that we need to keep into mind uh, when dealing with cranial pharyngiomas. Surgery, however, remains, in my point of view, the primary treatment modality for cranial pharyngiomas, although uh, that may change in the near future. Selecting the best solution. So what is the best approach for each one of your tumors? And cranial pharyngiomas are extremely heterogeneous in terms of presentation. And once we decide, we need to know how to do it. So how to convert decisions into actions. And today we're gonna touch bases about the anatomy and the details and how to perform a safe and effective surgical for endoscopic and the nasal approaches. In the follow-up of actions, of course, we need to look at the results and we need to understand how we can improve the care for patients. As Professor Constantino mentioned pretty well, we have to look not only at patients who can walk and talk about how is the hormonal function, how is the visual status, how is the hypothalamic function, and of course, especially how is disease control over time. Uh, this is my beautiful hometown from Fortaleza, Brazil, in Northeast uh, Brazil, that I encourage everybody to visit as well. So cranial pharyngiomas, as uh, we are familiar, they were initially described in the early 20th century uh, with uh, clinical descriptions of visual decline and hormonal dysfunction. Uh, Ayrton Hein is uh, uh, considered the one to first describe the characteristics of cranial pharyngiomas with squamal cells uh, from involuted uh, pharyngeal duct or raphex duct. Uh, Halsted then was considered the first one to perform a transnasal approach for an Ayrton tumor. And Cushing became famous, of course, with transphenoidal surgeries and pituitary tumors. He operated about 92 cranial pharyngiomas, but from those, only 14 were transphenoidal cases. And he did favor uh, actually open approaches after that initial experience that was not very successful for cranial pharyngiomas. So uh, the revolutionizing and the resurgence of uh, transphenoidal surgery really is uh, a success and accomplishment by especially Guillaume and Hargy in the 60s and 70s. That was uh, followed by, of course, the evolution of microsurgical transcranial approaches with a landmark paper by Ashargu, and of course, work with many others, in, including the three H from uh, the Sick Kids Hospital in Toronto, and the endoscopic approaches in the early 2000s with uh, combined uh, work from multiple groups. I would mention 
the group in the U.S. with the University of Pittsburgh Medical School and then Canada and Toronto, and of course the groups, the diverse groups from Italy. So in cranial pharyngioma, this is a nice paper by Dr. Laws, uh, demonstrating the evolution in terms of operative mortality that has decreased over time, and also the improvement in complete resection of cranial pharyngiomas at this, you know, in a parallel shape. So as mortality decreases, external resection have also improved. Uh, and then you see different factors, including uh, addition of new technology, MRI, CT scans, a microscope. But one thing that I think was not included here and was extremely important to me, especially this period of time uh, from the 80s ahead was the better understanding of microsurgical anatomy and the development of skull based techniques that have facilitated our approaches to removal and safe removal of those tumors. Therefore, surgical anatomy is uh, absolutely paramount for safe resection of those tumors. Craniopharyngiomas, as we know, are mostly cellar supracellar tumors located in the midline that can arise all the way from the subdiaphragmatica space near the pituitary at the origin of the stalk, all the way to the supracellar chiasmatic cistern space, all the way to the third ventricle. And the relationship with the superior hypophyseal arteries, optic chiasm, carotids, the clinoid and supraclinoid space are therefore paramount. Sometimes cranial pharyngiomas, uh, they do develop cystic components that can extend laterally into the sylvian fissure, and that may present uh, important uh, limitations sometimes for endoscopic and nasal approaches, and uh, in my opinion, remains the most uh, precise indication for an open approach for cranial pharyngiomas. In this beautiful Sagittal view of the Rotom collection, we see the most important anatomical structures that we have to consider when planning surgery for cranial pharyngiomas. Here you see in yellow the pituitary stock, the pituitary gland, of course, the third ventricle, as uh, commonly they can be, the cranial pharyngiomas can extend into the third ventricle, or they can arise in the supracellular space and push the floor of the third ventricle up with a pseudo uh, third ventricle extension. They can extend posteriorly into the interpeduncular fossa, and they can, of course, have this important relationship with the optic chiasm, which is usually pushed upwards, but can also be pushed backwards by the tumor, depending if it is prefixed or uh, normal fixed or retrofixed chiasm. The ACON complex, the one important aspect here you're going to see in a few slides is the relationship with the chiasm. And uh, when you have a very short or narrow pituitary chiasmatic window, the corridor via the subfrontal approach can be selected. However, it's also important to notice the distance between the ACON complex and optic chiasm. Uh, so you can decide if it is safer enough to open the lamina terminalis to go into the third ventricle via a subfrontal corridor. In this uh, beautiful paper by Prieto and, and Pasquale uh, of Madrid, uh, they have uh, developed this classification that I think is quite interesting and quite useful for identification of tumors that will arise uh, in the supercellar and extend really into the third ventricle and those that will push the floor of the third ventricle and therefore have a pseudo uh, ventricular extension. So the most important point here is really the ones, uh, in my opinion, is if the mammillary bodies is pushed up or not. So the ones that have the mammillary bodies pushed upwards are those that likely have a pseudo interventricular extension. Therefore, the third ventricle floor may be intact rather than uh, disrupted in tumor within the ventricle. The secondary third ventricular extension are those where the mammillary bodies, uh, as demonstrated here, is pushed downwards and then the tumor extends in the third ventricle and um, it, therefore there is a real extension uh, in the ventricular space. Uh, that's therefore important in my point of view in terms of decision making. The ones that have interventricular extension have a big opening in the, in the third ventricle. Those are the ones that I have even more careful when reconstructing uh, the, the skull base floor. In terms of uh, symptomatology, cranial pharyngiomas can be heterogeneous. Um, we have, of course, pituitary symptoms and pituitary dysfunction that is commonly observed in patients with cranial pharyngiomas, and that can go all the way from gonadotroph dysfunction all the way to uh, cortical trove and also diabetes insipidus. The infundibular tuberous syndrome is more likely related with diabetes insipidus, uh, but can also be related with some initial hypothalamic dysfunction which is definitely more common when you have cranial pharyngiomas extending up into the third ventricle, pushing the lateral walls of the third ventricle and causing dysfunctions that can vary from a body temperature dysfunctions, weight increase, and cognitive changes. 
This is a work in surgical anatomy that we did with Fred Gentili and Team Toronto that we were just trying to simplify some of the points of view about how one can approach craniopharyngiomas. So there are many, many different classifications. I think all of them have a role in the decision-making process. And um, in, with this one, we're just trying to kind of like maybe facilitate a bit of the work. So uh, on figure A, this one is the subdiaphragmatic craniopharyngioma that expands and pushes the diaphragma upwards and sometimes can have some extension into the supercellular space. The uh, B figure demonstrates the typical common supercellular craniopharyngioma extending upwards and pushing the optic chiasm. Type C is the one that extends into the lateral sylvian fissure and therefore requires, may require an open uh, lateral craniotomy. Type D is the one that is located into the third ventricle uh, with no disruption of the third ventricle four. So the purely intraventricular craniopharyngiomas in type E would be the ones extending into the interpeduncular space, uh, uh, retrocellular, uh, therefore including as well pre-ponching extension. So in terms of surgical approaches, we do have uh, you know, many, many different approaches that one can select. Of course, that depends on the anatomy of the, tu of the tumor, characteristics of the patient, and also the, the familiarity of the surgeon and the surgical team with the different approaches. Uh, we can go all the way from transcalosal to transpetrosal and endoscopic approaches. And here we're just going to review a few of those. So the first one are the classic frontal temporal approaches or the terional, OZs, and pretemporal variations. So when coming from a frontal lateral perspective, uh, we can have a pretty good access to remove uh, supracellular craniopharyngiomas, the ones with a retrocellular extension. And uh, the most precise indication, as I mentioned before, are for those, in my point of view, that have a lateral extension into the sylvian fissure as demonstrated here. When working those, through those corridors, it's important to remember, of course, that the sylvian fissure, you're gonna certainly work through opening the sylvian fissure and approaching the lateral aspect of the carotid cistern. And when dealing with the supercellular and cellular space, you're gonna have to work in between the chiate and the optic nerves in the interoptic space. You can access the third ventricle by opening the lamina terminalis. You can access the tumor located in the supercellular space between the optic nerve and the carotid and also between the carotid and the oculomotor nerve. The subfrontal corridor with the bicoronal subfrontal approach or even transbasal approach, if, if, if you feel that it's needed, uh, is an excellent approach, in my point of view, for the craniopharyngiomas, especially those that are located within the third ventricle with no disruption of the third ventricle four, and in cases where the space between the pituitary gland and the optic chiasm is quite narrow. I believe the combination of those factors would be the ones that would make me favor the, you know, by coronal subfrontal approach, because usually even if this space is narrow, so if the pituitary gland chiasmatic window is narrow, I would still feel comfortable in most cases by going through a uh, endoscopic and nasal approach. However, if the floor is intact, this space is narrow, uh, I think that's too much combination of factors that would, you know, favor, uh, that I would favor then a subfrontal approach throughout the translaminal terminalis corridor. For cases that extend all the way high up, so the third ventricular craniopharyngioma is extending with a major cystic component uh, through foraminal Monroe, I believe that those are cases where the transcolosal approach can be selected. And as you're going to see uh, today, there are options, uh, there are cases where we feel that even an endoscopic transventricular approach uh, can be selected for, you know, very well selected lesions. The endo, the, I'm sorry, the microscopic uh, transphenoidal approach is also a classic approach, very well described, but with the limitations that we're familiar with in terms of visualization and maneuverability, but of course, in very well experienced hands can lead to successful results for selected supercellular craniopharyngiomas. When looking at different, uh, the different approaches, we can see that uh, the classic ones have somewhat narrow corridors. Uh, does, they do require very retraction. Uh, we do have limited visualization, I would say, especially in the, in the microscopic transphenoidal, and uh, does require manipulation of neurovascular structures. So uh, what can we do to improve that? Of course, the endoscopic and the nasal approach through a midline corridor that provides us this excellent visualization of the midline structures of the optic chiasm, pituitary stock, acon complex, and in our opinion, provides uh, the best corridor uh, for not only visualization, but maneuverability for a section of, I would say about 90% of uh, most craniopharyngiomas. 
how to do it anatomy 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 and additional to anatomy this picture that represents uh, my national team in brazil in 1994 when we won the world cup there was the first world cup that i remember and uh and uh, that was a team so you it's not only about having a fantastic neurosurgeon to do this you need a fantastic ENT surgeon, a fantastic endocrinologist, a team of radiation oncologists, neuroophthalmologists, ICU members, uh, and uh, neuroradiology, nursing, uh, residents, uh, fellows. It's a combined approach that will lead to successful results here. So uh, the endoscopic approach, we're going to be doing a transcellular, transtuberculum, transplantum approach for removal of those tumors. This is the area of the tuberculin. It is important to remember, as you see here, you're gonna see that the, the limbo is sphenoidale, the dura fold will separate what is ahead, which is the plenum, and what is below, which is the tuberculin area or prechiasmatic space. And that's gonna be an important definition for our approach. So I skipped the nasal part. So we're here with the face, the sphenoid. Of course, we're gonna open the sphenoid face, and then we're gonna jump and see the back wall of the sphenoid sinus. The first thing, as usual, we have to identify the anatomy uh, of the plenum, the limbus, the tuberculin area in prechiasmatic space, identify the cell at the clival recess, and then the important anatomical structures in the paracellular space, the optic canal, the clinoid segment of the carotid, and above the optic canal, from the top of optic canal to top of optic canal, the limbus is sphenoidale. We start by drilling and removing the bone over the salad. Then we identify the dura covering the salad, the pituitary gland. Then we're going to go ahead, and if the midocline process is prominent, you can go ahead and remove that. That's really not a necessary part of the procedure because that just gives you access to the clinoid segment of the carotid. But removal of the prechiasmatic bone or the bone of the tuberculum, that is definitely necessary in my point of view. And additional to that, you should expand your approach laterally drill some of the medial aspect of the optic canals, unroof the medial aspect of the clinoid segment of the carotids, which will give you this most lateral exposure so you can access the most lateral access space of the chiasmatic cistern and have good control in close relationship with the origin of the ophthalmic artery and also posterior communicating artery. After that's done, you can see some of the planning. You really don't need all of that to the planning. You can just have a proximal exposure the limbus, I would definitely recommend to identify that. Pituitary gland, tuberculum. Then we open the during the pituitary gland. We do a transverse cut in the during the supracellular space. Isolate and ligate the spiritual cavernous sinus. And then we have the pituitary gland and the supracellular space communicated. You see here that we have the first arachnoidal membrane covering the chiasmatic cistern. After that is open, we can see all the contents of the chiasmatic cistern, which will contain the pituitary stalk, of course, and those very, very important branches, which are branch, the spirohypophyseal branches. And you see that you have a branch that goes to supply the optic nerve. So you want to preserve that branch and branches that will go to the pituitary stalk, which can be selected sacrifice, especially in patients that already have pituitary dysfunction. After that's done, you can see the contents uh, of the mesencephalic part of the liliquist membrane uh, demonstrated here that will separate the interpeduncular to the prepontine space. And the perforating branches that are like a shield of branches uh, right in the lateral aspect of the chiasmatic cistern. Here you also see pecan coming from the supraclinate segment of ICA going all the way to PCA and the posterior clinoid process. After that's all identified, if needed in some prechiasmatic craniopharyngiomas, you can also go and work uh, pre infundibular craniopharyngiomas. You can go and up, open the space above the chiasm, see the anterior communicating artery. Any selected cases, you can go and open the laminar terminalis from below as well. So the first case that I'm going to briefly show here, it's a 63-year-old patient that presented with us with a recurring craniopharyngioma and a previous history of pin hypopituitaries. He came to our clinic with this large cellar supercellar tumor that was extending all the way to foramenal Monroe with a large cystic component and a solid component with a supercellar and lateral extension. So we went ahead and selected an endoscopic and nasal approach um, that are gonna skip some of the endonasal part for the sake of time. And uh, we went ahead and drilled the, the, the transtuberculum transcellar exposure here. And you see, I like working with a double bow probe, just uh, this is something I brought from the lab to give me some maneuverability. 
after the exposure is completed, you see that in this case, we had kind of like narrow carotids, almost like kissing carotids in the clinoid space. So here we're doing this opening on the pituitary gland first, on, I'm sorry, on the dura uh, of the cella, then on the dura of the supracellar space, which will allow us to isolate the spirit cavernous sinus, then I ligate and cut that sinus with angled scissors, we go ahead and open the dura. Then uh, the caps of the tumor is open uh, to create some space. And then with dissectors, and I really love that McAlvey knife, we go ahead and I'm gonna transect the stock. As you see here, this, there was no pituitary function left to save in this case. And then we're gonna go ahead and do some debulking. After that, the first step is to identify the spiral hypophysial arteries, which were on both sides, as you can see here and then to create a plane to separate the tumor from the spiral hypophysios. After that's done, I like working with this micro shaver for the bulking of the tumor that will facilitate mobilization of the, of the capsule. After that, we identify the solid components. And once again, with sharp dissection, we continue mobilizing the capsule away. We can see the tumor being mobilized away from the basilar tip and its branches and we peeled away from the lateral aspect on the left side. Then we go ahead and peel the tumor in the intraventricular aspect, which allow us to go ahead and do a full removal of this tumor. After that's done, we inspect the third ventricle. Uh, you can see from in a row, we're gonna go ahead and see the aqueductus sylvius that is fully open, mammillary bodies, endoscopic with a 30 degree gives us this beautiful view. And then I see some residual tumor right here. So we're gonna go ahead and remove that right above the, the ICA, the supraclinoidal space. And uh, that is gonna then allow us to get a gross total resection of this uh, cranial pharyngioma. The reconstruction is done in a multi-layer fashion with Duragen, uh, fascia, and a vascularized nasoceptal flap. Um, and this allows this beautiful resection that you see here. The patient had preoperative cognitive deficits as well and had a quite remarkable improvement after surgery. The second case is a bit of a different story. It's a 49-year-old patient, an international patient that presented to us with, once again, recurrent cranial pharyngiomas, two surgeries prior that uh, had normal pituitary function and presented with a bitemporal hemianopsia. So she had this scan that uh, it looked like a way more benign cranial pharyngioma than the previous one that we saw. Um, she did have a microscopic transcenoidal approach before, so you see some signs of that. And she also had this lesion that I can easily identify this talk. So this looks to me like a pre infundibular cranial pharyngioma. And you see mostly a cystic component with some solid components on the top. So we did this one as a second case. Uh, so we first did the first one and then I did the second one. And I had the impression that this one was going to be more straightforward. And you're gonna see that that was not actually the case. So while we were able to achieve a gross total resection, the first case in this one decided to leave some of the capsule uh, due to the, to the location of that, of that tumor. I'm sorry, that, that video was not going well. But uh, uh, anyway, so in that case, uh, we had this uh, small capsule of the tumor here uh, uh, that uh, one can identify here in the top. Uh, and uh, we were able to get a near total resection, but this capsule of the tumor, uh, unfortunately, was not able to fully remove that. So here we got uh, some of the clinical results. Uh, and I believe that for endoscopic, we have to divide into two different areas. So we got the early stage of endoscopic and we got the current stage of endoscopic. And in the early stages, we had a major problem with CSF leaks. That's prior to the vascularizing septal flap. Uh, we had the initial learning curve, the technique, not a lot of understanding of the endoscopic anatomy. And, and now you see that we've been going like maybe to a third stage where the endoscopic, it's a fantastic tool, but it's really not new and uh, we have a, a balance now with the other modalities. So endoscopic anatomy is well established. We have fantastic uh, visualization with 4K high definition cameras. We have well dedicated microsurgical instruments for endoscopic surgery. And we have, uh, I, I usually quote about 5% chance of CSF leaks for most patients with cranial pharyngiomas. And uh, of course that number is uh, you know, decreasing over time as we build our experience. 
And uh, that technique, uh, in my opinion, has become a gold standard for craniopharyngiomas or a state of the art for most craniopharyngiomas. This is a paper that we published with the group in Toronto. Most of it reflects the experience of my mentor, Dr. Fred Gentili, that uh, we know as uh, we all know passed away recently and uh, we miss him dearly. Not only a fantastic mentor, but a very good friend for who I'm very grateful for all the, the, the learning points and friendship that, that he shared with us. So here in terms of extent or resection, the first thing we notice is that for patients, I'm sorry, that for uh, patients that present with tumors uh, that undergo a first resection, the chances of complete resection is much better than for recurrences. And of course, recurrences have challenges that include fibrosis, adhesions, and likely the fact that they were already more challenging uh, on the first surgery to start with. Also, the endocrinological outcome tends to be better in patients that undergo first surgery. And uh, finally, the, there is an improvement overall in terms of quality of life over time with surgery as observed here. In terms of anatomical nuances, we looked at this with uh, the group at that Schwartz in, in New York at Cornell. And that was a point like, you know, if the pituitary, as we were discussing before, if the pituitary space, uh, the pituitary charismatic space is narrow, is that uh, potential contraindication to the scopic and nasal approaches for craniopharyngiomas. And what we saw in this paper is that the answer would be no. So if the other anatomical nuances were favorable, that uh, we would still pursue endoscopic and nasal surgery for those. The one point, uh, the one caveat is that if the pituitary function is completely normal, and if you would like to preserve that hormonal function, then it really becomes a bit of a challenge because it's difficult to, to create uh, you know, an off corridor and you would still be mobilizing and working around the deep blue to, to get the tumor out. So it's important to keep that in mind. In terms of current results, this is another paper we published recently in Ward Neurosurgery. And you see that uh, CSF leak rates, they have decreased. Uh, the group in, in, in Cornell really have amazing results in terms of uh, CSF leak rates that uh, I believe, uh, you know, we should use it as an example. But uh, most series, they still have numbers that fluctuate between 5 to 15% to even. In terms of recurrences, we know craniopharyngiomas, they are nasty complex tumors that uh, can um, recur, even though we do the best of our work. And uh, sometimes if you achieve gross total resection, they can come back. And uh, I would say that especially once where we preserve the stock, they have the potential to come back over time. So we, we definitely need to consider new possibilities and new ways to manage those tumors additional to the, to the excellent result that surgery can provide. So when looking at this, uh, the group at Ted Schwartz, once again, did a beautiful work uh, looking at the impact of preserving or sacrificing the stock. And, and that's a very important point, as Dr. Constantino mentioned quite early in the, in the talk today, about uh, quality of life. So full hormonal replacement, I don't consider it to be something simple. And uh, actually, the patient that I was mentioning from Ecuador, the question that she had for us is, uh, do we, are we going to have all the, the, the hormonal replacement that is needed? And my answer for her is, is yes. I mean, I do know that Ecuador, they do have, uh, you know, the, the availability of those hormonal replacements. But uh, I also know that some uh, patients and some people all over, I'm original from Brazil, and uh, unfortunately, some parts of Brazil, that's not possible. Even here in the U.S., the coverage, uh, it's, it's definitely not perfect. So medication can be tricky. So if possible, and in selected cases, we would like to improve quality of life and preserve pituitary function. In that sense, uh, they looked at this and uh, what they observed is that uh, the, first of all, sacrifice, preservation of the stock can uh, be achieved and lead to good results with the caveat that for those that had gross total resection with preservation of the stock uh, had a higher chance of recurrence over time. Additional to that, uh, one can see that in about 50% of the cases that had stock preservation, they still presented with pituitary dysfunction afterwards. So to preserve the stock does not necessarily mean to preserve uh, pituitary function. And to preserve the stock, however, does translate into a higher chance of recurrence of the disease. So that information should be taken into consideration when planning uh, the management of your patients. The management of recurrent craniopharyngiomas is definitely an important topic, and we look at it uh, uh, 
about now four years ago, I'm sorry, five years ago with a group in Toronto. And uh, we saw that um, the management is definitely challenging, uh, but one in five patients may be just following and that disease tends to stabilize. But over time, one in five patients will need not only one treatment, but more than one treatment that will be surgery plus radiation or even the use of some medical uh, therapies that we have available now. In terms of next steps, we do have goals and, and issues that we need to address for cranial pharyngiomas. Here I mentioned specifically adult patients, but of course uh, for the pediatric population, that's definitely true. And I would say probably even uh, more true. So how aggressive surgically should we be? Should we be tailoring our approach? Uh, and I would say that the answer is probably yes. And that we should select the, how the aggressiveness of our surgery according to details, including age, hormonal function of the patient, hypothalamic function of the patient, therefore location of the tumor, and the availability of adjuvant tools, as well as the experience of your team, or understanding of cognitive deficits and cognitive function in patients with, between, uh, with cranial pharyngiomas is it still limited. I believe that that's a topic in outcomes that we have to better address as neurosurgeons and as uh, physicians addressing uh, this topic and or understanding of tumor subtypes and uh, potential molecular targets is only now improving. So we have a long road ahead to try to better understand those tumors and to define better treatment strategies. And therefore, with or understanding of those previous points, how we can define treatment selection. So this is a review paper published recently in your surgery, where the authors from um, British Columbia looked at the, the issue of complete resection versus subtotal resection followed by radiation. And what they observed here is that uh, there was no significant difference when gross total resection was uh, compared with uh, recurrence uh, uh, with subtotal plus radiation in terms of recurrence. I believe that's uh, an interesting uh, point, uh, you know, definitely like an interesting uh, finding. But the points that we have to address here, of course, additional to recurrence per se is like potential uh, side effects and limitations of radiation treatment, the availability of radiation treatment, the modality of radiation treatment. So all of those are too many variables that as any systematic review, a single paper would not be able to address. So we need to, in my opinion, to better understand how we can put this into picture as well. Uh, but to illustrate how this is important, I have this one last case. This is a patient that is 63 years old, presented to us during my advanced fellowship at the Cleveland Clinic. So this is a patient I treated with Pablo Racinos. She had a history of confusion, ataxia, urinary incontinence. So suggestive hydrocephalus symptomatology, had no visual deficits and had no hormonal deficits and presented with this uh, cranial pharyngioma located in the floor of the third ventricle. So I, I would consider this a infundibular tuberal cranial pharyngioma with third ventricular extension. So what to do here? Should we go ahead and do an endoscopic approach in this case or a subfrontal approach and you know, remove this entire tumor? What we decided to do here was to tailor the approach. She had no visual deficits, no hormonal deficits. She's 63 years old. So why not, uh, especially since this is the floor third ventricle, is pushing the laterals of the third ventricle, so likely hypothalamic adhesions, to debulk this from above, and then to consider fractionated radiation therapy to the remaining of the tumor. And that's what we did. And we did this endoscopically. So you see here endoscopic uh, intraventricular approach for a minimal row. And you can see the capsule of the tumor right there. And we're going to coagulate that capsule, bipolar, uh, transect the capsule. And you see a very you know thin capsule, th paper thin capsule, cut with the scissors. And after that's done, we went ahead and used, once again, a micro debrider, uh, intraventricular micro debrider that allowed us to remove this tumor to get tissue for pathology. And uh, this allowed us to mobilize the capsule of this cranial pharyngioma. And uh, here you see we are approaching the floor of the third ventricle. And of course, this is the part of the uh, mobilization of the capsule that we have to be more careful with. and uh, where we're gonna have some remaining tumor right attached to the floor of the third ventricle. And 
and you see here mammillary bodies uh and we're going to go ahead and, and just perforate the third ventricle floor, create a diversion for a CSF, and deal with the hydrocephalus there as well. So usual, usual maneuvers for third ventriculostomy. And uh, after that was completed, we consider the surgery finished. And this is the post-op scan. The patient did have some residual in the floor, the third ventricle, that we prefer to leave intact. And therefore, we did adjuvant fractionated radiation therapy, the usual protocol, 54 in 30 sessions. And she has been followed currently with no post-operative hormonal deficits or visual deficits. And of course, the full history is to be told. She did have radiation there. So let's see what the outcome would be in the next five to 10 years. But once again, she's 63. She's doing fine now with no new issues. And we even solved the problem of hydrocephalus with that approach. The additional topic that is extremely important and I think will be the game changer in years to come, especially with the upcoming results of a trial that has been done um, here in the US and in some multiple centers here, is the issue of uh, BRAF mutations and the impact of BRAF inhibitors for papillary cranial pharyngiomas. So this mutation was identified in 2014 by Priscilla Brassianos and group in Boston. And um, additional to the BRAF mutation, uh, the CTTNB1 mutation in adenosinomatose cranial pharyngiomas have also been identified. We looked at that uh, during my time in New York with Ted Schwartz, and we identified the association between uh, uh, the papillaries with uh, BRAF and uh, CTNNB1 with uh, adenosinomatose, and of course the the morphological aspect of those. We're we're studying this uh, paper as well. In um, in an after that we're working right now, we plan to demonstrate uh, and to review all the different aspects of this development of both papillaries and adenosinomatose. For papillaries, the, the targets that we have identified so far are useful targets uh, because we already had MAC inhibitors and BRAF inhibitors in the market for melanomas specifically. And now for adenosinomatose, that's the next uh, target and where we have to identify potential um, you know, um, pathways that we can target as well and uh, hopefully lead to one more uh, treatment strategy for those tumors. So in conclusion, uh, endoscopic and nasal approach represents, uh, in our opinion, the approach choice for most cranial pharyngiomas, but that requires surgical anatomy knowledge, experience, and definitely a multidisciplinary team. Maximum safe resection is the word of the day. Preservation of the optic nerve, for sure, and hypothalamus, for sure. In my opinion, is always mandatory. Uh, the pituitary stalk preservation is a topic of discussion, I think, all the time. And, uh, but uh, however, I believe it should be uh, considered and attempted in uh, most cases, if not all cases, but uh, that's definitely more uh, reasonable for pre infundibular cranial pharyngiomas. Adjuvant radiation therapy may be needed, especially in cases of subtotal resection that I would advocate for. And uh, new treatment modalities and further understanding of tumor biology and long-term outcomes will certainly impact the role of surgery that I believe will continue to be an essential tool for those cases but will play a role along radiation and as well now medical treatment. So thank you very much. I'd like to thank my mentors. Uh, I'd like to thank the team here in Jacksonville under the leadership of Alfredo Quinones in Raza, my chairman. Uh, but I'd like to thank as well Evandro de Oliveira, uh, my mentor from Brazil, uh, the man that uh, inspired uh, my work in, in microsurgical anatomy and Fred Gentili, my fantastic mentor from uh, Canada, from Toronto, that uh, shared with me the pearls of endoscopic and nasal surgery. And uh, both of them are gone now, and both of them gone in the last year. It's a tremendous loss, of course, not only for me, but for our entire neurosurgical society. And um, I'm very honored and privileged to have both of them as friends and mentors. And uh, I'm, uh, you know, fighting to one day be able to make them proud of our work. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank, thank you. This uh, uh, really to the force of uh, of a master surgeon. Um, I enjoy tremendously your presentation. I think I think it's very balanced. Um, a few of the comments I I sympathized very much. Um, one one incredible thing is the deviation between adult craniopharyngioma practice and pediatric craniopharyngioma and. Um, I don't know if this is due to, to the more uh, liberal 
um, attitude in change of treatment of pediatric neurosurgeons, so whether it's due to the different um, pathology and, and pattern of recurrence. So, so some short comments before we take, we take um, uh, questions and, um, from the crowd. When you look at the recurrence, anything less than 10 years is, is not significant with craniopharyngiomas. And I think it is quite established, at least in pediatric craniopharyngiomas, that after gross total re removal, the recurrence rate without radiotherapy is at least 30%. Um, some people say up to 50%. So if you look two, three years and there is no recurrence, it doesn't mean there will be no recurrence. The second point is that um, attempting to go for a redo surgery, whether from below or from above, is really, really a, a, a way to get complications and limited um, success rates. So you may consider alternative treatments. One of the reasons I really dislike craniopharyngiomas, excuse me, is because when I meet with the parents for the first time, there are so many options that I have to present to the parents. I do not think that today at this age, the option to do a gross total resection is the only option. There are so many other options, as was mentioned here, subtotal resection, just doing minimal surgery adding on it proton therapy. Um, for example, case number three or the other cases with the cystic craniopharyngiomas, I would puncture and go ahead for protons. So there is a deviation a little bit between pediatric and, and adult practice. So it, it's far beyond the technical aspects of what you see, how you approach, how you prevent CSF leak, et cetera, et cetera. And what is missing, I think, from the literature is a real careful um, analysis of the complications uh, by a, a unbiased uh, team. And the other thing is the recurrence rate over many years. So um, let's let's have some questions. Raja, are you are you controlling this? Yes, of course. Any I questions? just, if I may, just add one comment that uh, if Dr. Fred Gentili would be here, he would just applaud uh, the the last comment about recurrences. I remember he very well in his presentation that he would have a beautiful case of a cranial pharyngioma of his that he had a gross total resection and he would show, okay, one year, beautiful, two years, beautiful, five years, beautiful, and then boom, eight years, the tumor is back. So I take that very close to my heart. I fully agree with, with the comment. And uh, I think we do a bit of a poor work in adult cranial pharyngioma literature about recurrences. We have to share the numbers that we have in the literature. But I do agree with the sentiment that uh, there, is a, there is a possibility here. The one detail that I, that I take in consideration for adult cranial pharyngioma is that I think we are, at least we are less concerned about the whole developmental impact of hormonal uh, function in adults. So I believe that in that regard, we tend to be potentially more aggressive with that. And, uh, and I have to say that the techniques and, 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 and the way that we operate on those nowadays, I think they vary between groups. And, and I believe that that has also an impact. Yeah, the other point that, that I think you stressed very nicely is that there is a difference in the treatment depending on where the patient is and what the team can offer. This is true for the surgical ability. And, and I've been very concerned with people that come from uh, departments do, do not have the experience or the technology and seeing a beautiful video and say, now I can do it and I will do it. I've been very concerned with this. I think a lot of patients were harmed uh, by this. And then also, if I like to add radiotherapy, it depends on the availability of, of precise photon IMRT, 3D reconstruction and planning and, and protons perhaps, if, if you believe in protons, which is not available in, in huge parts of the world. So what do you do um, if you don't have replacement therapy, you have a big cystic craniopharyngioma and you're uh, in Africa or in Asia uh, or in Latin America and places and the patient cannot travel. And what do you do? I mean, would you just uh, put a drain in, let the hydrocephalus subside, uh, and then consider radiotherapy at, at the longer stage? So there are a lot of open questions uh, left behind. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. I fully agree with that. 
Thank you very much. We can take comments from the house. Professor Ramesh Nair is an expert in pituitaries and endoscopic uh, surgeries. Thanks. As well. Thanks. So, Apollo, I liked your lecture. I think it was a beautiful lecture. You covered a very spectrum of this uh, terrible disease we have to deal with. And um, and also you mentioned about this being a sort of gold standard. I totally agree in a subset of craniopharyngeoma. This is the endos endoscopic approach could be the gold standard in dealing with, you know, we've been debating about the approaches for a long time. And uh, at least in a subsection of this patient, uh, you could get a growth total resection in the safest possible way through this route. Um, and in terms of always the, the issue about stock resection has been a dilemma, uh, which I debated for many cases, whether to do it as a primary procedure or as a, a secondary procedure in a recurrent case, and it's been well studied as well. My Still my sort of preference at this stage is to try and preserve it if I can, unless it's completely thinned out by the disease process itself. Um, but if you're going to leave some tumor in the ventricular wall or even otherwise, and, and you have to consider adjunctive treatment post-op, why not try and preserve the function and then take it in, in a future time? That's been my practice. And also, I think, um, as Prof. Uh, Constantini uh, said, we need to look at the uh, overall picture, not just not the surgical resection, but in terms of other uh, possibilities of treating this patient with, an, uh, with the uh, uh, new trials coming up with the BRAC muta mutation and inhibitors, I think we, we certainly do have some patients who would benefit from these sort of technology and treatment. And, and it, this is something in spite of um, have, having achieved a total resection, you still feel that they come back and you feel sort of failed in, in managing this patient. But it is not something which we fail because it's a disease process and often with time and, and, and advance in technology and science, we probably will be reaching a stage where you could treat it better. And so the, it is evolving still. And um, and I, I, I agree, I think it, endoscopic resection probably the best way to achieve this at this point in time, but with time, it, this will change. Uh, but overall, I, 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 uh, I think your lecture was quite beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you much. so much. We can invite Professor Suresh Nair, sir, as well. Professor Suresh Nair, any comments? Yeah. That, that was a great lecture, Paulo, and equally great comments from uh, Professor Constantini. And what a few comments, you know, uh, I, if I if I read it correct, uh, if I understood it correct, you told that uh, from that publication from Toronto, they told that uh, uh, out of, uh, if there are five recurrences, only one has to be followed, one requires further treatment. Other four can be followed up. I don't know. That is not what we have seen. I absolutely agree with Professor Constantini that uh, he, he told 30% of gross resection. It is much more than that. Over a period of 10 years, I think nearly 50% of so-called inverted coma gross resection, they recur. Uh, and uh, also you told a publication where it is adult craniopharyngioma, where you have written uh, gross resection versus uh, subtotal followed by radiation. The outcome is same. I think it is for you are that publication, I think it's for adult. But knowing very well that many of the adults, they have adamantinous type also. If they can tell whether it is... Uh, uh, only papillary they addressed or it is a combination of both it would have given some information and lastly both to uh, professor constantini and to follow uh, professor constantini very clearly addressed sometimes it requires only just this task patient absolutely correct if uh, uh, but what about that old treatment of intracystic bleomycin which is the only point which you didn't address rest everything you have addressed your comments from both uh, uh, Professor Constantini and from Paulo. Oh, um, uh, 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 Professor Constantini, if you'd like to begin, uh, please. Yeah, I, I think regarding the bleomycin and the interferon, I think uh, the picture becomes more clearly uh, in pediatric craniopharyngioma that this may be a temporizing measure. Uh, in some cases, there's a great, great paper from Toronto Sick Kids. Um, you can gain time with it, but it's it's not curative. Okay, that uh, my friend Dr. Ben from Taiwan has joined us. Yes, Ben, any comments from you? Hey, hello, Paulo. Uh, it's nice to hear uh, your lecture again, 
And uh, I'm, hello, Yalon. And uh, may I know uh, in your experience in cranial pharyngioma, um, uh, do you have a, do you have, uh, ever have experience in uh, chewing of the posterior kinoid or mobilization of the pituitary gain? And uh, in which cases um, would you consider this uh, maneuver? Is there any hints from the preoperative MRIs that you would consider this maneuver? Yeah, so th that's a very good point. And uh, that's the, the idea behind the concept of including that type E or retrocellular uh, cranial pharyngioma, because that would be the one case if there is extension into the prepontine sister where that maneuver would be selected. So um, I would select that for one that is calcified and has that extension, because most tumors, most cranial pharyngiomas that we will extend backwards, they will end up pushing the liliquous membrane, the mesencephalic part of the membrane downwards, and therefore they already created a corridor to use, so you don't really need to kind of like mobilize the posterior clinoid. In terms of uh, doing a pituitary transposition, I would uh, vote to do a transcavernous approach like Juan published, and uh, that's how I like doing that. And in that case, if you have a calcified component located posterior to the dorsum, that's when I would uh, do and remove the posterior clinoid. The one caveat here is that I would only consider that for cases that had had certainly a more than one approach, so complex cases that haven't been responding to treatment, and where likely the pituitary gland function is already not working very well. So the whole concept of pituitary transposition is likely not necessary. So you can take out the pituitary gland, remove the dorsal cell and the posterior clinoid, and then address the, inter the prepontine sister with that maneuver. So that's the only thing. I mean, uh, uh, at least for me, in, in my experience, it's hard to conceive uh, a cranial pharyngioma case where I'm going to be able to, you know, mobilize the pituitary gland, remove the retroinfundibular component, and uh, by doing so, get a, you know, a gross total resection, preserve the gland, preserve the stock, and have a beneficial in the outcome. So I think that's where the balance lies between surgery and adjuvant treatment and pathology of the disease. So I would consider a maximum safe resection, uh, consider the addition of adjuvant radiation therapy, and, uh, and then look at other possibilities in that case. The big problem is here is the gland function. I mean, I don't know if I would be able to save any gland function that would justify that maneuver. So it's different than for meningiomas, for example. Thank you so much. So nice to see you again. Nice to see you, Ben. Thank you very much. Yes, my co-host Liu Bun Seng. Any questions from you? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Raja. Thanks, Prof, for a very nice talk. Uh, I have two questions, Professor. One is the risk of a CSF leakage in the recurrent cases. Uh, would, would you prefer the same uh, uh, path or you choose a different path? My second question, Professor, how do you define a complete resection? Uh, is it mean that everything is removed? Because most, most time the tumor is cystic and uh, MRI may not be picked up if there's any residual. And, and also, do you mean that also if all classified area have been removed to consider complete resection. Thank you, Professor. It's great. So, it's great. Yeah, uh, so in my opinion, um, uh, the gross total resection should be, uh, of course, a combination of the MRI and the intraoperative glance because in my opinion, if there is calcified tumor left, uh, it's a near total resection, not a complete resection. Uh, and that I believe impacts your outcome. So um, if there is calcified tumor left, that to me is a near total resection, if, if it's a micro calcification or so. Uh, in terms of post-operative CSF leaks, indeed, recurrences do have, if, if you're going to redo an endoscopic uh, that had already been endoscopically done, you do have a higher chance of CSF leak. That's a matter of fact. And I quote about 10 to 20% chance. Those are the cases that indeed you want to have a fascia lata, indeed you want to have a lumbar drain. But I believe that uh, if the endoscopic corridor, if the midline corridor would be still the best corridor in your point of view, that would be the corridor that I would choose if we have vascularized tissue for reconstruction. Thank you, Prof. Thank you. Thank you very much. We had a wonderful session. I would like to have the concluding remarks from our uh, chair, Professor Shlomi Constantini. Well, this is, this is always beautiful to discuss with such a group of experts and some of the questions that were risen here. Um, Pranipharyngioma is a chronic disease and um, we may consider treating it as a chronic disease. It's not a zbang and finished. 
uh, in many cases, and we should look at the patient as a whole, especially uh, in children. So thank you all the panelists and this the wonderful talk, really, really wonderful talk from Professor Almeida. Um, and uh, we can move forward. Thank you very much, Rad. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much, Professor Almeida. It was indeed a wonderful lecture. And I would like to inform our viewers that this webinar is broadcasted on YouTube, WeChat, and Zoom. And right now we have 1,359 people who are live watching it on all the different channels. We are extremely thankful to Professor Shubin for broadcasting this on the WeChat channel as well. So we'll go to our second session and I would like to invite Professor Ramesh Nair to say a short introduction and invite Professor Bukun for his lecture. Thank you. Thank you, Raja. I thank the CNS for this incredible effort to promote um, the neurosurgical education throughout the world, attested by the, the vast audience you have online. And it was a blessing uh, during this difficult time. And I thank my mentor, uh, Prof. Kato, as well, and who's been untiring in, in this uh, effort. Um, I think the next topic is about the giant pituitary um, tumors and their management surgically. Um, as you know, pituitary tumors, when they become giant tumors, they pose at, at different challenges, not only from the tumor perspective or the surgical perspective, but also even preoperatively, many of them are compromised uh, from an endocrine perspective. Many of them may be on long-term steroid replacement, even may have DI in many rare cases, and also compromised from a visual perspective. And tumor may have an encroached on to structures which are difficult to manage, including cavernothinus, anterior canal fossa, or middle canal fossa, or, uh, or even posterior canal fossa, or maybe into the ventricle, just like uh, Shavo Polo was talking about the craniopharyngeum. They may enter into the uh, third ventricular system, causing obstructive hydrocephalus and requiring additional emergency treatment of such patients. So they, they pose a, a wide ch a challenges for a surgeon. And traditionally, as you know, when the, when the evolution of pituitary surgery, many of these tumors were treated. Uh, in fact, most of the tumors were treated transcranially, but things have changed with this advanced technology we have with, uh, with uh, more uh, knowledge about this, the anatomy of the, the region and the skull base and final dissection. We are able to get these tumors in a slightly more in, less invasive way endoscopically, minimally invasive, with uh, the best possible safer and uh, uh, resection. Um, I, I think it, it poses a challenge for all of us, and I'll be very keen to hear from uh, Prof. Wukun, who's got extensive experience in such tumors. Um, and so I, with that, I invite Prof. Wukun to give your lecture, please. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Thank you. Uh, it's my uh, great honor to have a lecture here uh, to uh, show you my team the experience of endoscope and nasal transfernoid approach for giant epidural adenoma. Uh, my hometown, Hangzhou, is a very beautiful and city. Uh, and, and uh, famous for its uh, history and uh, landscape. Uh, the rice uh, competition um, was proved by a geologist in Kwahu Chinese and uh, went back to 7,000 years ago. And uh, um, architectural rings of Liangzhu also make the city well known as it was built 5,000 years ago. And uh, West Lake is a name card of Hangzhou and uh, visitors of, of the world come to China for the lake. Now, um, digital Hangzhou city also famous for its internet economy as uh, Alibaba, NetEase, such a uh, campaign all this here. Uh, this September, Hangzhou will gonna hold the 19th Asian Games. And their hospital, founded in 1869, has eight campuses with a total of 4,470 beds and over 7,000 employees. The Department of Neurosurgeons 
established in 1957. And in the last year, uh, we performed over 8,000 uh, clinical automa surgery and over 2,000 intervention surgery. And our center listed six out of 10 in Chinese neurological rank. And today, tonight, I will uh, show my, my team's experience of the EE uh, and NSO and the scope approach for the giant turret uh, noma. Pituitary uh, noma is a benign neuro and green tumor uh, that originates cells and account for uh, 10 to 20 percent of our um, primary intracranial tumors. And giant pituitary noma are defined as a tumor with largest diameter, uh, large or equal to four uh, cm, and I characterized uh, its uh, inversiveness and. Uh, and irregular necrosis. Surgical resection is the first line treatment for most giant pituitary adenoma except prolactiva. Either intracranial or transphenoid approach can be adopted for surgical removal of giant pituitary adenoma. The history, uh, this is the history background of pituitary adenoma surgery. And and uh, this picture from the human and neurosurgical surgery uh, is for the craniofangioma. Um, we can see a different approach for the cranial tumor for the uh, uh, celiac disease. Um, the disadvantage of the cranial tumor um, is uh, one is the, the re re reflector of the brain tissue. And uh, another is the, the um, damage to the optic nerve. And for such a uh, giant pituitary uh, noma, uh, we think it's, uh, it's a big uh, challenge for uh, neurosurgeons, uh, which is the optimal surgical method to deal with uh, giant pituitary noma. Uh, colonial tummy surgery or transphenoid microscope surgery or endoscope, pure endoscope surgery, or combined cranial tumor and uh, transphenoid approach, and the one or two stage surgery. Advantage of transphenoid and endoscope surgery. Uh, with the innovation of endoscope techniques and the improvement of surgical skills, that the treatment for giant pituitary adenoma uh, on the endoscope and the nasal transphenoid approach has been a safe and a more uh, efficient choice. And, uh, in the recent decade, uh, our team we uh, try the. Uh, was the the endoscope for the giant uh, for the giant pituitary and then toma. the clinical the, uh, the clinical feature and the outcomes uh, of two hundred and thirty nine patients with giant pituitary toma who underwent spinoid uh, uh, surgery at the, our hospital. Um, from general uh, 2015 to October 2021, collected from the medical records. And the basic clinical information, the patient's age, gender, function, and the surgical procedures, and the imaging features, maximum diameter, and the investigation characteristic, and the tumor shop, the such. And the uh, histopathological characters, uh, including pathological results, uh, KI67, P53, uh, this uh, were respectively reviewed. Mm -hmm. Svens and uh, uh, start software were used for status uh, analysis. 
uh, this is the result. Uh, and giant uh, pituitary adenoma are also set with uh, high surgical complications. Uh, sorry, the total of 260 and uh, 39 patients, uh, 137 female and uh, 102 males with pathological confirmed PA were included. The mean age was uh, 51 years old. Range from 19 to 84 years. Non functional pituitary adenoma was detected in 162 patients, and 77 patients had functional pituitary adenoma in these cellules. Patients may present with facial accurate and official field deficits. The average maximum. And diameter for the giant pituitary adenoma was uh, uh, 0.4.5 uh, uh, cm. The tumor were round in uh, 14 cases, dumbbell shaped in 89 cases, and the multiple, uh, multiple, multiple uh, in 136 cases. Based on the preoperative MR and results and uh, intraoperative observations, 220 uh, patients has a uh, Kevin sinus uh, uh, invention. Uh, 165 patients has spinoid sinus invention, and the 10, 222 cases showed the uh, surplus su su uh, cellar uh, infection. The highest nose peak grade was uh, 0 to 1 for 26 patients, 2 for 46 patients, and 3 for um, 59 patients. And the uh, nose peak 4 grade for 108 patient and eight patients, which were indicative of the extended of Cavernous sinus infection and the aggressiveness of the giant uh, pituitary adenoma. All, all patients underwent uh, underwent uh, TSS, of which uh, this uh, was treated with a neuro uh, endoscope and uh, seventy one patient with a microscope. Uh, according to postoperative MI. Uh, gross total resection was achieved in 46 cases, uh, nearly total resection in 56 cases, uh, subtotal uh, in uh, 68 cases, and uh, partial resection in 69 cases. In addition, we used the largest regulation model to analyze the risk factor of the external resection. The overall maximum diameter was 0.69. The nurse grade was showed a significant effect on the extent of resection. Gross total resection was more likely achieved in giant uh, PA with a lower nose per grade, especially nose grade two. Other effects, including age, gen, surgical method, uh, unilateral or bilateral nostrils, tumor sharp, uh, invention characters, KI-67 index P53 were not significantly collected, uh, correlated with the extent of the section. A total of 119 patients experienced the surgical complication, and the most common complication uh, was post-operative diabetes, diabetes, the eye, uh, which occurred in 91 patients. The incidence of intracranial infection and the CSF leakers was 15, and and uh, 15 respectively. Uh, furthermore, 18 patients with CSF SFD developed a secondary intracranial infection. 
and the eight patients experienced the post-operative intracranial uh, hemorrhage due to abdominal tumor blood supply. And uh, in adequate intraoperative hemostasis. One patient, one patient experienced the intraoperative ICA injury and uh, was discharged after intervention therapy. Two patients died of intracranial infection and um, multi organ failure. Uh, in addition, there was a significant difference in the incidence of CSF link between the neuro and the scope and the microscope. So the giant, uh, the giant uh, pterygoid adenoma associated with a high surgical complication uh, rate compared to uh, normal pterygoid adenoma. Mm. These are uh, and the nasal and the scope approach related complications and consistent with the uh, previous reports. The three most frequent complications in our cohort were DI, CSF leak, and intracranial infection. DI is caused by a post pituitary dysfunction, and its incidence rate typically range from 9 to 22% and may increase up to 53% at the same center. Nevertheless, only three to 4% of the patient develop a permanent DI. Um, peer patients with uh, visual abnormalities, um, supracellular extension or large tumor are a high risk of develop, developing DI postoperatively, which could be reason for the high incidence of DI in our cohort. And CSF link are generally the result of surgical injury and the tumor invasion, especially in case of giant PS with anterior cranial force extension and supracellular expansion. In our cohort, most cases of CSF link occurred during tumor removal. And in addition, we found that the rate of CS linkers was high in the ETS group than in the MTS group. Um, a previous study uh, reported a significant uh, association between CS link and uh, post operative intracranial infection. So, an uh, advanced scope is reconstruction is very important. Uh, this uh, Patient is a male of uh, 60 years, three years old. Um, uh, we can see um, the result of the, um, the surgery is uh, good. Um, and uh, the post operation, uh, the, the patient uh, is okay. But three days after uh, discharge, um, we can find the CT scan. Uh, they are the cranial pneumothesis. Uh, it showed the CSF linkage. So for uh, such a patient, um, the emptiness uh, operations to rebuild, uh, um, repair the, the base of the, the cell, uh, uh, it's very important. Mm. This is uh, uh, the very typical UCLA multi-layer multi construction technology. Um, I think um, many, you know, many doctors are familiar with this, uh, uh, this uh, procedure. Although the um, vascular mucosa flap is effective in the scopus reconstruction, uh, we now try to use the middle turbinate as the, the patching material as the patching material for the comfort and the, our factory protection of the patient. So uh, for the for the uh, destruction, uh, we should consider the defect location. Uh, defect size and the complexity of the 
uh, anatomy structure and uh, history of previous surgery of the radiotherapy. And this is the canal of the, uh, the standard of scopus requirements. According to the different location and uh, uh, defect size, uh, different uh, patching uh, strategy can be applied. And uh, this paper, the order, provided uh, the CSF link and uh, introduced the, the detailed step of um, repair. Um, patch materials, including autologous tissues, uh, including fat, muscle, facial, uh, and other soft uh, tissue and the cartilage burn. Um, I would like uh, to use the, the, the tissue from the, the patient's uh, uh, desire, including the fat, the clutched muscle, and uh, uh, the facial. And the pedicle meso sept flap uh, has good uh, blood uh, supply and uh, largest uh, size, and uh, uh, it's easy uh, to survive. Mm, for the mm, high flow, the CS link, I think the pedicle meso sept flap is very helpful. Mm. And there are other materials, including synthetic materials, power materials, um, homologous dual matter, uh, such as things uh, can be used for destruction. <coughs> and uh, these people from China, uh, Beijing Tiantan Hospital, uh, Professor Liu Pina. <coughs> They, uh, they, they reported a total of 79 EETS patients uh, were included and uh, the effect of continuous dual suture in endoscope surgery. And the uh, regressive analysis showed that dual suture could significantly decrease the incidence of CS linkage uh, after surgery. And uh, this is uh, uh, my video. Um, we do the search. Uh, by the edge of the fashion. Using this uh, special instrument. Sliding uh, knock knot, this uh, technique is used uh, here. But it's need more, more time. <laughs> but it's uh, uh, Efficient for the CSF link. This is another complication of the uh, injury of the clotted artery. This patient with pituitary adenoma was not found uh, having no aneurysm before surgery. Um, Yeah, in the opening, the, you see the dark blood, uh, the bleeding from the cavernous sinus. When I want to, to stop the, the bleeding from uh, the cavernous sinus, suddenly, Massive, suddenly massive bleeding. And I realized it's the 
the rupture of the aneurysm. Uh, fortunately, we use the bipolar uh, stop the uh, bleeding. Then we dissect the tumor. So post-operative MI show that the tumor was removed. <coughs> Um, imaging is DSA. Imaging and DSA confirmed the, uh, the aneurysm. The site is palatinoid uh, with a neck of 2.8 mm. No hematoma was found on the CT scan. And uh, seven days later, uh, the covered stent assistant um, embolization was performed. Angiograph indicated uh, that the uh, aneurysm was completely embolicized and uh, the patents of the um, parent artery was fine. The patient is lucky. And uh, for this, uh, this patient, uh, it's a very big invasive uh, pituitary adenoma. Said that during the resection, uh, that the fatal hemorrhage during expo exposure of the uh, phenomenon the sinus. And uh, we, we uh, packing and uh, immediately emptying uh, covered the stent uh, treatment. But uh, uh, two weeks later, the patient died. Uh, this is anatomy of the uh, ICA. The surgical approach always blocked by the, these uh, uh, small branches of the ICA. Therefore, the possible arterial hemorrhage, hemorrhage when we open the media wall of the cavernous sinus, did not uh, consider the injury of the internal carotid artery, but the, the hemorrhage of the small branches vessels. So we can um, try bipolar to stop the bleedings. In the presence of anatomy variation, this is easy to cause uh, ICA injuries. Uh, if the operation, the procedure didn't follow the midline. Uh, this is the literature from the Pittsburgh. Um, it's the protocol of the treatment for the injury of um, carotid artery. And this, this is another people uh, talking about the, the treatment of the um, carotid artery injury. Um, several, it's talking about the several uh, important steps uh, can successfully um, manage this um, complication. Um, first, uh, the surgeons must be familiar and uh, competent with the endoscope approach and the anatomy. Um, CT scan, um, preoperative CT scan is required, including the precision of the relationship of the cavernous uh, ICE and uh, lateral sphenoid, uh, sphenoid wall as well as the potential midline line of the artery. MR or MI uh, to confirm the suspicion of IC anomaly, anomalies uh, is also supported as a close assessment of tumor relationship to ICA. Mm. Uh, factors such as uh, Mm, previous radiotherapy, uh, revisition surgery, and uh, acromegaly are helpful to identify the at risk patient. Uh, intraoperative uh, is very uh, important 
uh, to keep the surgical field uh, clean uh, during if the carotid artery injury. So the the, uh, the assistant the assistant uh, is very important. Um, and uh, the experience in this situation and uh, have a clear, uh, clear surgical plan can be life-saving for the patient. And uh, we uh, uh, try, and uh, we try the bipolar and uh, uh, the crust muscle uh, patch to, to, to be effective uh, in gaining the primary life, the, the hemo, hemostasis. And uh, the literature talked about the uh, clips, the use of the clips uh, and uh, uh, other, other methods. Mm. But we have a, uh, we have uh, we have seldom uh, used such uh, methods with the use of aneurysm clips. And, uh, and if the, the if the bipolar or the uh, packing uh, by the muscle cannot be achieved uh, hemostasis, so um, we uh, the, the patient should transfer angiography and uh, endovascular uh, intervention uh, at once. And the operative management is focus on the prevention of complication of clotted artery injury, uh, named uh, pseudo aneurysm, and uh, and and uh, uh, and uh, clotic cavernous fistula (CCF). Mm. The follow-up by repeat investigation at one week, uh, one month, and three months, and one year, uh, uh, it's important. And uh, our procedures were, uh, carry, were carry out the carry, were carry out the by um, carry out using a pill and the scope approach uh, primarily with. Uh, the aid of uh, 30 degree, uh, 30 degree four mm endoscope held by uh, chief surgeon and the uh, uh, vascular nasal uh, septal flap was released uh, on the phenopenolytic artery and and uh, to put on the bottom of the surgical field. To be, will be used for uh, scope-based reconstruction this, 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 uh, after tumor removal. Uh, and then we use the uh, neural navigations and the uh, Doppler ultrasonic to identify the clotted artery and uh, uh, guide the extent of the burn resection. <clears throat> and um, uh, meticulous uh, um, by many dissection to separate the tumor uh, from the body uh, and the neurovascular structure. Mm, tumor, arachnoid attachment, uh, uh, superiorly and uh, literally along the optic chasm and the optic nerves are divided sharply uh, to reduce uh, the risk of the injury of these uh, uh, structures. And uh, uh, we also uh, use the uh, tissue growth applied uh, to the flap edge and uh, uh, the edge that covered with the uh, such a cell and uh, um, collagen sponge. 
and uh, I uh, seldom use the fully uh, gathered and the extended approach we use the selectively uh, in cases in which the primary surgeon um, felt that uh, additional brain removal uh, would increase the, the extent of our resection. And this meta-analysis uh, showed a total of 15 studies. Uh, 1,014 patients were included uh, among 487 studies that involving the uh, endovascular uh, surgery and uh, 527 studies that, that deal with microscope surgery. It showed a high rate of uh, close to total resection were performed in the endoscope group than in the microscope. And <coughs> since the gross total resection in the optimal surgical outcome of giant picture adenomas, uh, we identified the independent risk factors of the extending to our resection in order to plan a suitable surgical uh, strategy. Tumor size and uh, in the uh, 70s, our giant epithelial adenoma into surrounding structures are key factors that limited the extent of resection. Consistent, consistent with uh, the, uh, the previous uh, report, we found that uh, some giant epithelial adenoma with low nose pupillage could be satisfactorily removed despite their large size. Uh, thus, common science invasion of the pituitary adenoma is uh, crucial for uh, planning surgical procedures and the tumor size can provide uh, complementary uh, information. Uh, conclusion, the management of giant pituitary adenoma remains a therapeutic challenge due to their post-operative complications, uh, especially uh, CS of link, uh, uh, intracranial infection and uh, uh, carotid artery injury. The maximum diameter and the nose rate of giant periodoma significantly limited the extent of uh, resection, uh, which warrants a reasonable surgical plan. And, uh, and, uh, and the EETS approach can provide a, a bright surgical field and satis satisfy surgical outcomes. Uh, this, uh, uh, this drawing is by my, uh, my friend uh, Dong Bai. Um, it's the Sanxin Day culture relics of uh, Sichuan. Uh, Guangyuan. Um, it's shocked the world once they were born. And uh, the, uh, the natural pigment painting, Sunshine in Ancient Su, is based on the executive the culture, Radicus Sanxin Dui, uh, which combined with the traditional green landscape and shows the um, artistic style to strengthen the texture of the objects. Um, just as the end scope, um, which, is, uh, <clears throat> which, is so, which is small, but the future is uh, infinite. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Weekin, and that was a great talk you went through the literature uh, very extensively and also talked about your large series, which I think is this fairly a large series and, and a lot of experience there. And also you spend quite a lot of time in terms of the complications, which is so important these days that uh, we all learn from each other and looking at ways to avoid complications, especially about the CSF leak. As we all know, there are different 
practices and from unit to unit, a lot of variation. If you look at the literature, every one of us have our own personal preference in terms of the kind of repair we do for such cases. And interesting to see in many units in one of the papers you mentioned there about the, the continuous suturing process of the one of the layer of the uh, the repair. And as you can imagine, it's a very fiddly process, the time consuming. And the, but with time and time, uh, you get better at these things. And I'm certain that uh, doing that might help in terms of reducing the the CSF uh, leak. Um, and equally, um, also with uh, further improvement in our instrument design, we should be able to do these sort of things in a better and, uh, way. Um, and also, you talked on the uh, one of the fearsome complications which you all uh, worried about when we do endoscopic approaches, especially extended endonasal procedures for tumors of the skull base, cranios, or meningiomas, or even large pituitary tumors. And this is something which is such an important to topic and, and very, very appropriately you spend a, a good amount of time to talk about it. And, and this is the thing which sort of pull back, especially the, uh, the, the teams which are beginning in their journey uh, in these sort of uh, operations. And uh, it's all about, um, as one of the papers you showed there, the Australian papers mentioned, talking about the preoperative management decision uh, in all these cases you need to have a plan in mind you need to have a plan during the operation and also after the operation this is what is so important and good to see um, such complications being discussed um, that extensively um, but overall i think it's been a, a wonderful talk and thank you for for uh, telling us your ex experience i will go on I'll, I'll talk about it a bit further but i will give chance to others and including Salva Paula, who's on the uh, panel here, uh, to comment, and then I'll come back later. Salvo, anything more to add uh, you would like to comment, Salvo? Salvo Almeida. Hello, uh, sorry, I just got a phone call from the hospital, but uh, well, first of all, a very impressive experience. Like that's really, I fully agree. It's uh, you know very, very large series of cases and, I think we definitely have tons to, to, to learn from you. So congratulations. Uh, I also appreciate and I really like the, 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 the comments and the, the transparency in terms of complications. It's always something that, uh, that we have to look at honestly, uh, because we do have complications. If we're, tasking, like, if we're tackling like complex cases such as those, we will face them sooner rather than later. And I think the best way for all of us to grow and learn is if we share our experiences. I wonder in terms of some of the, because we have, you know, the giant adenomas in terms of larger than four centimeters. And I would say that we have the giant adenomas and, and the invasive adenomas, the ones that will go everywhere, like cavernous sinus, posterior fossa, anterior fossa, and so on and so forth. In your routine for those cases, um, do you do CT angiograms, for example, or you, how do you select which cases you're going to do a CT angiogram? Yeah, uh, thank you for your question. Uh, in my routine work uh, for the older patients, uh, especially 70 years old, and uh, some patients uh, with uh, hypertension uh, and uh, the, the, the family history with aneurysm, such patients, uh, we, uh, uh, we, do the, we did the uh, CT scan before the uh, operations, and uh, yeah, 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 and uh, uh, I think it is more important uh, the MI, MI scan before the, the pre-operative MI scan is also important. That you can find the the the, uh, the, the aneurysm before the operation if you uh, read it uh, carefully. Mm -hmm. Very good. Yeah. And one more question I had. Um, do you use lumbar drains at all in any cases? Mm -hmm. uh, you, you know, the, for the CSF linkage, uh, the lumbar puncture after or during or before the operation? Uh, uh, 
yeah for example for a large invasive case uh do you place a lumbar drain uh even before the case so you kind of like keep the drain or you just use lumbar drains if you have a leak normally i uh, don't do the the the, uh, the, the drain mm, uh, if uh, the during the operation the high flow uh, high flow cs linkage happened and uh, um, I did the uh, construction, um, then the second day after operation, I will ask the patient uh, uh, I, uh, if the, the self linkage happened, I will do the, the change. But if not, I uh, will not do this. Uh, uh. Okay, very good, thank you. Appreciate Thank it. You. Thanks very much. One thing which I would just to add, as as Paula mentioned and uh, Dr. Wokina to mentioned about the the uh, the diagnosis of aneurysms, uh, which sometimes which are, which are not picked up pre-op uh, uh, and that possible. I recently had two cases where we identified the aneurysm projecting into the pituitary tumor, uh, and uh, the last minute and uh, had to make plans. And sometimes it can be a problem because I had this recently we had a case, um, the chap uh, with uh, Cushing's disease with an adenoma uh, on the right side. Then we also found that there was an aneurysm projecting towards the adenoma on the right side from the carotid. So a patient needed fairly urgent treatment but then you have this annual so this it becomes a dilemma what to do because you, if you try to go for a radical excision for such tumors you are risking the uh, uh, the risk of uh, having an interoperative rupture of the aneurysm that just like dr woken uh, had shown in one case there was a rupture of an aneurysm on the other, on the other hand such aneurysms which are very basal and more medial often surgically more difficult often in a in a current well, we treat them with endovascular flow diverter. So when you use flow diverter in such cases, then you got to put these patients on often dual anti platelets for some time, and that makes a, and the next op the pituitary operation more difficult. So it's always a balance, uh, and also often these patients have to be on for long term anti platelets, especially aspirin for long term. That will also be an issue for your surgical procedure. So these are things which sometimes can compound our management decisions. And also preparing for a possible ICA rupture, as Dr. Wokin mentioned about having instruments to deal with it and having a strategy to deal with it, possibly clipping instruments. Actually, you need for endoscopic clipping, you need dedicated designed clipping application applicators and the clip blade as well. The standard clip we use for a cranial operation may not be um, uh, enough for this because you need a very low profile instrument for this. So these are things which we will have to think about. One question before I add it over to Raja and others to ask on, you mentioned about intracranial hemorrhage after such tumors and with a large giant pituitary tumor, this is a problem because sometimes when you cannot remove all of the tumor, if you leave some residual tumor, there is a risk that they can have a postoperative intratumoral hemorrhage like a hematoma in the cavity. I don't know whether you mentioned it in your series, but I would like to know what your experience with those sort of big tumors and uh, bleeding into the tumor cavity after the operation. What, what are your thoughts on it, Dr. Wukin? Uh, uh, I, I, I have the experience of at least 2,000 uh, uh, endoscope uh, endoscope uh, operations, and uh, I think uh, there are 1,004 or 500 uh, uh, operations for the particular and the noma. And I remember only two patients uh, need a re operation um, because of the, the, the uh, hem uh, hematoma uh, inside the surgical field. Yeah. Uh, my mm, uh, uh, my opinion uh, opinion is uh, uh, the first uh, since I think uh, if you resect resect uh, the more you resect uh, the the, uh, uh, the the possibility of the bleeding 
the less possibility um, bleeding uh, cava. And uh, sometimes uh, uh, the, the tissue or the pr procedure very difficult uh, if you want to, to resect all of the tumor. Um, uh, the uh, five uh, cm or six cm, um, the maximum diameter, the, the tumor is so big, uh, and uh, uh, even with the the angle, the the endoscope, you cannot uh, uh, see clearly at every corner of the tumor. Uh, but my uh, my opinion, it's uh, need your time. It, it's need your some time. You can irregulation the the surgical field. Uh, um, normally, the patient, the, the situation of the patient uh, is okay. The bleeding will stop by him by themselves. It's just uh, uh, need your time, your recognition, and the wait and the watching. I think uh, mm, uh, it's very helpful. Uh, if you put uh, uh, catalog, uh, cat cartilage, uh, sponge, uh, uh, such a cell, such a flow or other materials, you want to stop the bleeding, you put inside too much such materials, I think it's not a good idea. Mm -hmm. And uh, when um, I removed the tumor, um, um, during the restructuring, uh, uh, um, if not CS linkage happened, uh, that happened, uh, uh, during the operation, I will keep the keep uh, how to say uh, keep some space. Uh, if they are the bleeding, they can uh, flow to the to the nasal cavity. Yeah, uh, you know, <laughs> I'm I'm sorry. <laughs> it's no. difficult for me to explain. But I think uh, uh, regulation and the water and the watching. What you start, uh, with same time, it's needed your patience. It's a very good uh, message. Thank you. I think that you made it very clear. Um, thank you for that. Um, anyone else? Uh, I think Ben Ben Yang is this one. You want to? Yeah, go on. Yeah, hello, I have some uh, question for uh, Dao Wu. Uh, so uh, thank you, Dao Wu, for your talk. And uh, uh, and do you have uh, experience for those giant pituitary uh, adenoma or some extensive uh, uh, setter and parasetter tumor? Do you uh, have, do you have uh, experience in combining the craniotomy and also the endoscopic approach together for the uh, extensive tumor? So, or you prefer a stage uh, uh, procedure for the for those uh, giant tumor? Uh, uh, in preference to combine with a uh, uh, craniotomy. Uh, thank you. Uh, um, for the uh, giant uh, uh, the noma, uh, uh, some of them they uh, have a, you know, they have a um, special shape. Uh, uh, ma 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 multi lobula, uh, su uh, such cases, and uh, we, we uh, can use the uh, crantioma, um, crantioma approach, and uh, remove the most uh, uh, larger part of the tumor. Then I uh, put put the the, the end scoop inside the, the field uh, to find the. Uh, you know, to, to different corner uh, to find the, the uh, residual, the tumor. Okay. So and uh, and uh, um, once time, it's not uh, not the pituitary, it's a mangioma. I use an uh, endoscope uh, uh, transna uh, transnasal transphenoid uh, approach. At the same time, uh, uh, my uh, my assistant uh, uh, he resected the tumor um, by microscope from the uh, 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 by cranial tumor. Uh. Right. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Any questions from my co-host Libun Singh? 
Yeah, thanks, Raja. Thanks, Prof, for a very extensive uh, talk and very informative. I just have one question, Professor. Regarding your case series of partial resection, uh, is, do you think that those cases were anticipated before the surgery? And, and for those with a partial resection, is it more in a microscopic or transcranial or uh, tra I mean, uh, endonasal uh, transphenoidal cases? And if you encounter those, uh, when will you go in again? Uh, will you try other therapy or you go in resection in other uh, 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 entry? For example, is transcranial, you go for transcranial, Professor. Thank you. Uh, the, the time, you know, the second, second uh, the time when I performed the second uh, operation. Yes, uh, yeah, when would you perform second operation for that? Or you, you choose you the, the, the uh, partial resection in your series? Uh, the, 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 uh, for the two, two stage uh, patients, I'm sorry, you, you know, the, the second time I performed the, 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 the operation, you mean the time? Yes, yeah. Would you do uh -huh. a surgery, a resurgery for partial resection? Hmm? Yeah, I think it's uh, the better inside the three months. Yeah, thank you, Professor. Thank you, thank you very much. We had a wonderful lecture, and I must congratulate Professor Rukun for his uh, wonderful series of giant pituitary adenomas. With that, we'll uh, conclude. We'll take the concluding remarks from Professor Ramesh Nair. Thank you, Raja. Um, this has been a wonderful session. Both uh, speakers were excellent. Uh, the wealth of knowledge out there, and uh, and uh, I think thank you for both speakers there this morning and a lot of listeners around the world, especially trainees. And uh, it's good to hear about these uh, uh, advanced uh, techniques and, and vast experience and their uh, uh, issues related to the complications and management of those complications, which are more important because it is, you know, if you learn from your own mistake, it's going to take a long time. So it's best that we learn from others' mistakes and complications. Um, so for that reason, I think this session and this webinar has been extensive, uh, extremely useful for all of us. Thanks once again for uh, organizing this. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. We had a wonderful participation today from all around the world. Professor Takashi Kon from Japan has also joined us. Hello, Professor. Thank you for joining. So now it's time. I'll conclude this officially on behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President, Professor Yoko Kaito. I would like to thank both the speakers of today, Professor Shao Paul Almeida and Professor Wu Kun, as well as the chairs, Professor Shlomi Constantini and Professor Ramesh Nair for the time and support for the ACNS webinars. I would also like to express my sincere gratitude to Professor Shubin for broadcasting this on the WeChat channel. And today we had around 1,359 audiences who joined us live. Also special thanks to my co-host Lubun Singh for joining in today, as well as all the distinguished dignitaries of our profession. So until we all meet on next Wednesday, it is bye-bye from all of us. Thank you very much for joining.